My name is Komala. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking today. Hello, my name is Hannah Shah. I'm a writer and editor at Esso Monash. Hi, I'm Harit. Uh, I'm a second year student. I'm pursuing a master's in applied economics and econometrics. Hi, I'm Joel. I'm a first year graduate diploma student studying at Monash Caulfield. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Phil. I'm a third year arts and commerce student here at Monash Clayton and I'm also the graphic designer at Esso. I work as a part of the Education Policy Analysis and Advisory Practice at Deloitte Access Economics in Melbourne. I wrote about the potential for Indigenous employment programs in Australia to support empowerment based on the key findings from a year-long evaluation that Deloitte Access Economics conducted of three sub-programs of the Indigenous Employment Programs in 2021. Indigenous employment ties into the empowerment discourse because research indicates how the existing mainstream employment system is set up from a predominantly Western point of view um, that tends to prioritise capitalist economic development and colonial perspectives. And at a policy level, there's a large potential for systemic changes to occur and for that to permeate other levels where practical actions can be taken to action change. But it also reveals how complex the challenges and opportunities of Indigenous employment programs are. I think overall readers can not only view the empowerment discourse within the context of Indigenous employment, but they also get to have a glimpse about the work that is currently done at Deloitte Access Economics. I wrote about individuals and companies transitioning to a zero waste way of consuming and producing. This is where they refuse to use packaging or any access resource, excess resource in the consumption and production process. They would, as a second resort, reuse the packaging and only recycle as a last resort. I chose to write about this topic because I work at a cosmetic store and the amount of product I see every day is very concerning. However, I am seeing brands transition to producing more um, packaging free products like solid shampoos and selling products in different ways such as um, having refill fountains in the store where you can refill your own bottles with shampoos and conditioners. Um, both ways prevent more packaging from being produced and transported which allows for a smaller environmental impact. Um, these kinds of practices really inspired me and made me want to write about the zero waste movement. Recycling can often be more damaging than for the environment than creating a brand new version. Taking the example of, say, glass, glass is a lot heavier than plastic, requiring more fuel in the transportation process. Um, furthermore, in order to recycle glass, we have to heat the material up to very high temperatures, and the energy used is often sourced from fossil fuels. And finally, um, harvesting sand, which is used in glass production, causes coastal erosion. Through reading my articles, readers can find out how they can reduce the waste they produce in their day-to-day -day lives and find out which companies are worth supporting in order to make the world a better place. So I've written about the role of conditional cash transfer and uh, how it is used in the developing world to provide a buffer to the poorer segment of the society and it acts uh, as a shield for all these people to uh, deal with any adversity that they face during their lifetime. So what interested me the most was the sheer scale at which this program uh, works. Uh, so programs like Progressa in Mexico, Bolsa Familia in Brazil and Path in Jamaica. So these conditional cash transfer work on a pre-specified condition by the government to allocate the capital on the human resources and more specifically on the child care, child health and education. So a few of the key interesting points about the article points at the rationale behind the conditional cash transfer programs. And one of the key factors uh, is that the literature points out at the huge deficit in investment on child care uh, at the early stages of development. And what happens is when the child does not receive the proper nutrition and vaccination at the early stages, they're not able to develop the proper cognitive functions which helps a child to participate in the mainstream economy when they reach adulthood. The developing nation does not need to wait to reach to the advanced industrialized nation 
and then start working on one of the key issues of issues of poverty at the early stages of development they can still work on programs like cct to de dedicate the problem dedicate the problem of underinvestment in human capital uh, I wrote about the resource curse, which describes a situation where resource-rich countries can sometimes be economically worse off than uh, resource-poor countries. And it ties into empowerment, not in a conventional way, but kind of a challenge about empowerment. Um, I chose to write about this because it's a paradoxical and counterintuitive economic scenario, and those are the kinds of issues in economics that interest me. Uh, I featured a lot of uh, interesting studies that I found that kind of demonstrate the presence of natural resources isn't always completely beneficial. Like a study that showed that when a mine opens in Africa, uh, corruption and the amount of bribes being paid to local officials increases by around 30%. And some other interesting studies that show that the presence of oil can cause a country to skew away from democracy and towards a more autocratic system of rule. I think that the lesson to take away from my article is that re countries with abundant natural resources aren't necessarily doomed to suffer from this resource cursed phenomenon, but it's the choices that a government makes in allocating those resources that affect a country's outcome. I wrote about the uptake of rooftop solar panels in Australia, and I believe this ties into empowerment because as more and more households take up solar, they're beginning to supply more and more of their own energy and electricity, and relying less on grid supply as well as energy companies. I chose to write about this because I'm, I'm generally interested in the economics of renewable energy and the trends currently seem like renewable energy is becoming really, really uh, cost effective and what we're seeing is that energy companies are actually closing down coal-fired power stations because they're just so economically inefficient. I really like the point about um, solar panels being able to provide electricity to remote communities because it's actually such a really cool way uh, for, to allow these communities to be completely self-sufficient uh, from the grid and provide their own electricity as well as without having to go get fuel from ages away just to go power a diesel generator for example. I think the key takeaway for this article is that as more households take up rooftop solar over the next 10 and 20 years we're going to see a transition to one of the purest forms of free market ever and that's in the electricity market as uh, market power shifts from the few energy companies to millions and millions of Australian households.